things it does, calendar, mail, maps, photo management, all this sort of stuff, both can be given away for free because the cost of delivering that digital service to you is so low and increases your attachment to Google. And it will make money from you someday. And whether it makes money when you go to search and it runs ads there, whether it makes money because it's putting ads against other third-party content that you're using. If you have a critical mass of people using Google as a search engine and, and you know, the largest pool of ads against which to run against these search terms, you're able to match them better. And if you can match them better, advertisers are inclined to use you more. And this becomes a sort of self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. Um, what Google does has is not so much a monopoly on search. The switching costs of search are pretty, you're one click away. What it has is the beginnings of a monopoly over internet advertising. The great irony is today's market dominance is about as far away from where Google started out as it's possible to imagine. To understand why Google's become so rich and influential, we need to go back to a more idealistic period in the company's history. Like the web itself, Google began as an academic dream. Stanford University in California has a reputation for academic excellence, but its alumni have a track record of converting research into money. You don't go to Stanford and not know that there is a very high probability that when you get to the end of graduate school, you are going to start a company, or you might never get to the end of graduate school because you're going to start a company. Back in 1996, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were PhD students investigating how they could sort the good pages on the web from the dross. The web then consisted of about 10 million pages compared to the tens of billions today, but it was expanding rapidly. So it was already impossible for humans to visit and rate each website. Page and Brin developed a way for computers to automatically do the job. I went to meet their mentor, Professor Terry Winograd, to find out more about their breakthrough. They realized that every time a person puts a link on their own web page to some other page, they are in a sense voting. They're in a sense saying, that's interesting enough for me to put a link there. And therefore, if they could add up all of those votes from everybody who built web pages, they would get a result which was going to be a very close approximation to what really is interesting to the general public. Page and Brin devised an algorithm to calculate links between pages on the web. And it gave an independent mathematical value of how interesting a page was, based on the number of links to it, and whether those incoming links were from pages that were themselves interesting. Page and Brin realized that what had begun as an academic project could actually be used to solve one of the biggest challenges on the web, how to find what you're looking for. So what is the relationship between interestingness and search? So having figured out a way to decide which pages were interesting to what degree with PageRank, then it was possible to give search results that were much more useful. So when you did a search for computer, say, and it would find all the pages with, say, the word computer on it, then it, the ones that it gave me at the top, at the beginning, at the first page, would be the ones that have the most interestingness, which means that they're the ones I'd be likely to really want to go look at, not the, the stray junk. So that improved, to a tremendous degree, the kind of results you could give. This was perhaps the most effective search engine yet. Page and Brin called it Google. And Google benefited from the web's rapid expansion during the dot-com boom of the late 1990s because its link counting algorithm actually got better as more pages were added to the web. But they also faced a challenge. Each time someone used Google, they used a little bit of its computer servers. A single digital transaction, like a search, may have a negligible cost, but millions of negligible costs add up to a fortune. The problem for Google was that as the web expanded, it required more and more expensive processing power and more and more expensive storage. But it didn't have a real way of making sure that money was coming in. Larry would come back for advice now and then. He'd just come to the office and we'd have a chat. And we'd talk about the technology and what they were building. And it was all great. And then I'd say, well, but how are we ever going to make money with this? 
And he would give this sort of smile, little look and say, I don't know, we'll figure that out later. Most search engines at that time were funded by advertising, but Larry and Sergey didn't like that. In fact, this is the research paper that they used to present Google to the academic community. And what they said was, we believe the issue of advertising causes enough mixed incentives that it's crucial to have a competitive search engine that is transparent and in the academic realm. This is what Google looked like in 1998. Free of adverts, simple, clean, and white, Google's looks hark back to the amateurism of the early web. Yet whatever the ideals, Google still had to pay its way. Charging consumers to search was quickly dismissed as an option. Instead, Google realized that they could use their search engine to revolutionize advertising. This was what would change our relationship with the web. They knew that, by definition, when we search for something, we're telling Google our precise wants and desires. And with a system like Google's, those could be easily captured and traded. What if you knew precisely what your customers wanted at any time and could instantly provide them with it? Well, that's the holy grail that marketers and advertisers have been searching for for decades. Because with that information, they could create tailor-made ads that would target directly the customers who were likely to buy their products without wasting money on the people who wouldn't. Just two years after voicing doubts about advertising, Page and Brin went into advertising and changed that industry forever with a system called AdWords. Type in a specific search term, and specific adverts appear in two sections of the Google page. Now, if you click on one of those adverts, money flows straight to Google as the advertiser pays for your traffic to their site. For the consumer, it's as simple as that. But what makes this special for advertising companies is that it's so targeted a selling process initiated by a consumer looking for something in particular. Unlike the failed dot-coms, AdWords seem to be the perfect marriage between what the web can do and what consumers want. The first rule of the Internet is that you can speak to each individual as though they're a different person. It's not a broadcast mechanism, it's a narrow casting mechanism. And what AdWords is, is it's a single ad to a single person every time. It's catching people in motion. It's catching people who are already in motion towards something, already goal-oriented, already halfway there. Through targeted advertising to consumers, Google, and ultimately the web, had found a way to pay for itself. But Google's ambition ran even deeper than money. Page and Brin wanted to transform the web itself. They built into their advertising machine the analytical insight of their search engine. And crucially, this was what cemented Google's influence on the web. Their goal was to filter for consumers relevant ads from the irrelevant ones. So every time you activate AdWords by searching on Google, it unleashes a chain of events which can be illustrated like this. Let's say a car company wants to see their ad appear at the top of the page when someone searches for the words new car. They tell Google the amount they're willing to pay to make their advert appear. The process is actually an auction, so lots of companies might be competing for the top spot. But Google doesn't necessarily give the top spot to the highest bidder. It judges ads based on how relevant they are to the search and a range of indicators of the quality of the advertising company's website. In simple terms, P, the price the winner pays, is related to the value of bid multiplied by quality. This gets top billing. In this way, Google doesn't just rake in profits, but positions itself as a powerful arbiter of quality and relevance online. Google will make the entire world's information available to you and occasionally we'll show you some advertisements. If you want to click on those ads, there might be something very valuable for you to click on, but you don't have to. I think that's